Welcome to Nerd Stalker. I am Adolfo Ferranda. And I'm Greg Gloria, aka Social Gray on Twitter. How you doing, good, man? Good, good, man. Yeah? Yeah, good, good. Let's get to it, man. Lots to cover. So just a reminder, everyone, with the show, uh, we do have a Patreon page, uh, patreon.com forward slash nerdstalker. We'll, we will be offering uh, something eventually for that value, but we could uh, appreciate your support if you want to give us any type of donation there, patreon.com forward slash nerdstalker. Okay, let's get to it. Uh, There's so much happening right now. Um, okay. So today is April 16th. Uh, if you're recording this in, or listening to this in the future, uh, just to let you know, this is as of this recording. Uh, Trump is announcing that he's going to. He, Trump is announcing that he's going to announce <laughs> when he's going to reopen parts of the United States with declining COVID cases. Now, uh, you know, some people are very pro and some people are very against this. I'm kind of excited to get the economy kind of moving again. Um, is there a potential danger to it? Maybe, probably, um, but those are, you know. That's the story, all right? You you weigh the, the implications of that yourselves and think about that. But I guess we're going to be moving forward with that. I know California and Washington and Oregon, I believe, did a partnership of governors where they've sort of taken it upon themselves to, uh, to decide when they are going to. So I think there's a little bit of clashing there between uh, uh, federal and states, which is really mind boggling because I would never thought I'd see the day when Republicans are fighting for federal rights and Democrats are fighting for state rights. It's, it's like the, the upside down right now. Yeah, but anyways, that's crazy. All right, so as far as the stock market, I want to talk that tech saved the day today. Uh, the NASDAQ lifted the stock market up today. Uh, again, as of this recording, it was all carried up by guess who? Netflix. Uh, we're all using Netflix now. Everyone is, and if not, they've signed up for it. And um, everything cloud actually related, and I'm talking about uh, cloud infrastructure, things like Azure, uh, Amazon's AWS, uh, Microsoft is Azure things, anything SaaS related. Uh, and uh, we're talking uh, cloud databases, everything infrastructure, cloud-based is, is crucial right now to the economy and to the world, I think. So no surprise there. Uh, that's where I think we're going to see continued growth for quite some time. It's a bit of a no-brainer. Okay. And now uh, some economists I'm hearing uh, saying that the economy probably won't really come back in, until 2022. At the earliest, um, banks are seeing increased loan defaults, of course, right? So as people lose their jobs, uh, people can't pay their debt. And as a result of that, you're going to see, and we are seeing now, loan requirements getting stricter, getting harder. That means fewer people, people are going to be able to buy things like homes or you know, loans on uh, things like small businesses, et cetera, to start businesses. And what that means is that that's going to slow down uh, liquidity or, or dollars flowing, you know, between everyone. And that's not good, right? That slows the whole engine uh, that needs to be greased. So until we get, until that part of it gets moving again, I think we're going to be in for a rough ride for a bit. Okay, now main uh, to what... The interesting part of the story is to me is a COBOL. COBOL programming is back. COBOL is a programming language. And what's really interesting about it is also additionally, there's a, another sort of theme here that government technology just kind of blows, it seems like. It kind of sucks. Uh, we're hearing about today, IRS coronavirus stimulus check tracking tool is not working. A lot of people are complaining about that. And... Um, Let's go to this COBOL story. Yeah, so, okay. So states have basically been starved for uh, modernization funding. And as I mentioned, COBOL is a very super old programming language. And not only that, over the years, um, the COBOL programmers have sort of aged out of the workforce. And this is forcing states to scramble to find the fluent coders in times of national crisis. So this has happened before. Uh, think um, Y2K, they were, mm -hmm they made a big resurgence. So it seems like whenever there's a national crisis, it's like call out, you know, the, the bad signal for COBOL programmers. And the problem with COBOL programming is this is such a legacy language that when it was originally rolled out, it was also originally rolled out on legacy hardware. Additionally, back then there was no really computer science degree. So there was no, they were sort of learning as they went along. So oftentimes there's no rhyme or reason to the way they did things. Uh, oftentimes they'll be, you know, it was just sort of making it up as you go along, as I mentioned here. So there, there was no 
predefined practices or best practices, I should say, and oftentimes no documentation whatsoever. So it's not a trivial thing. And it's not so easy as just going back and learning COBOL because you have to learn COBOL, master COBOL, uh, the version of COBOL, the really old one, whatever particular government system you happen to be working on. And then additionally, you have to sort of do a lot of sleuthing in terms of what may or may not break what. So if you make a code change, it could break some other variable elsewhere that could affect another government system or something like that. So you can see that there's a, it's a spider web of danger and, um, and very super challenging. So a survey by The Verge found that at least 12 states still use COBOL in some capacity in their unemployment systems. Alaska, Connecticut, California, Iowa, Kansas, and Rhode Island all run the aging language. Earliest, earlier this month, New Jersey, Gover New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy made a plea for more COBOL programmers to maintain the state's unemployment system during a press conference. So yeah, so as I mentioned, this is, this is nuts. It uh, first came into fashion in the 50s, so that's sort of what you're looking at here. And um, whenever there's a problem with the IT, COBOL was the scapegoat. Is, is what a lot of people are saying. And they're saying IT system systems always get the short end of the stick when it comes to funding. And this is was no difference in government and especially COBOL systems was often the scapegoat. And I, I would see that in previous uh, professions that I had that the older technologies were also scapegoated and were less likely to get funded or support uh, as opposed to the new technologies where all those type of initiatives were higher priority. So it's a, we're in a real precarious position with this now, and I found it really fascinating. It's fascinating because I remember we talked about this in a long time podcast, I, I probably the earlier days, like 2011. Remember when we were talking about health records? Yeah. How did that yeah. is COBOL, right? Yeah. Yeah. So much. Yeah, so much, man. <laughs> And yeah. and um, you know, you mean you don't have your uh, digital PDP eleven still standing around? Yeah, yeah. Oh, to God. test your COBOL. Uh, to test your COBOL. Code. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's amazing. I think it was HP or IBM just offered uh, free COBOL classes online because a lot of the original uh, modern day programmers don't know how to do it, and so they're so desperate now that they're offering these free classes. So go ahead, uh, programmers out there, uh, if you want to make it some extra coin, uh, go ahead and learn it. But I mean. It's uh, dangerous roads ahead, that's for sure. It's, oh, my God. Uh, so, Greg, what is this uh, CCC thing here? I came across this on um, – I followed Dale Doherty. And if you guys don't know Dale Doherty, he was uh, basically the founder of Make Magazine uh, way back mm -hmm. in the early 2000s, right? I think mm -hmm. uh, probably something like that. And, and also the, the the guy who thought about the Maker Fair. And mm -hmm. Nerd Soccer has always been a big supporter of the Maker Fair year to year. Love it. Uh, Adolfo and I would always go out there and interview uh, startups and new products. And it was really a smorgasbord, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. It, it, yeah. But anyway, he, he was the guy that also, I always thought when I followed him, he was always the guy to empower the little guy, right? The mm -hmm. guy who doesn't have the resources and giving him tools to really express his creativity, right? His or her creativity. So, um, He's back at it again, and what his concept is here is back in the Depression era, you know, when uh, Adolfo and I's uh, parents or grandparents, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it, was around in the Depression, they, they, the government created this thing called the Civilian Conservation Corps. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that I know the Salvation, uh, so Civ Civilian Conservation Corps was really, um, I came from George Washington High School here in the city, and... Um, that core employed artists to make beautiful murals on our mm. on our um, auditorium walls, mm. and so that's that's where I kind of kind of understood where wow they put artists to work. And so, what what he's suggesting here, we create a uh, civilian response corps, mm. uh, which basically the concept is is that uh, a organization that will band together in time of need and then really. Uh, coordinate local civic response efforts, hmm. you know, as opposed to, you know, these other, you know, these other nodular uh, corporate uh, giving entities that would say, okay, well, here, uh, we're, we'll, we'll put $3 million into this. We'll put, you know, he, hmm. what he's suggesting is that they want, he wants more of a concerted approach towards this type of response, which he thinks, you know, um, is good for everyone. Cause you know, you see everyone right in the news, rising to the challenge 
to help this COVID thing in, in different ways, right? And, right. and I, I don't know, what, what do you think about that? What do, what do you see about in your area about that? You know, it's funny you mentioned that because we were driving through San Francisco the other day and there's a real popular meme I, I've been seeing online too right now is um, uh, during this time, fix all the damn roads is the thing, you know, because like San Francisco is notorious for having potholes and terrible roads and, and the roads are, it seems like forever under construction and never getting done. And this would be the perfect opportunity for, I think, the government to do something like a New Deal type of situation, right? Um, where all, you know, just redo our infrastructure, re rebuild bridges, rebuild roads and that kind of thing. So I think it's along that same spirit. And, and I think that's a really good idea is, and I, what I like about it is it's on a much more sort of com community level too, which I think is, is super important nowadays um, to, to support your local community. Yeah, you know, the interesting thing is that you know he he did tie this back into the makers, <laughs> so so yeah, he's really yeah. calling citizen makers. It's their time right now. Yeah. It really is the makers' time right now. Uh, we'll get into it later, but uh, things like um, like support creating you know building your own hardware when it's t time tough to get times to get parts, things like that to build fix your own stuff, uh, um, you know uh, gardening and that type of stuff in terms of growing your own food to some extent. I know that was part of Maker Fair as well. Um, so Arduinos. a lot of that stuff. Yeah, a lot of that, a lot of that spirit is is of the most importance right now. I, I was like surprised. Did you see that article about Arduinos uh, driving um, some of the uh, um, respirators? Oh, yeah, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, That's incredible. Because like, it, it, you know, they don't really need really sophisticated um, power. So they were like right. using like Arduino 1.0, you know, really the earlier yeah, ones. Yeah, sure. Right. And sure. like they were gearing yeah. up to like deliver like a hundred thousand of these babies or something like that, you know. Very so, cool. Yeah. Anyway, but anyway, let's let's move on. I thought it was a great idea. You know, catch yeah. Dale Doherty. He's a good guy, maker. Uh, anyway, uh, what's this death to the open office? Which I kind of understand what it is, but you know, why don't you talk about that? Yeah. So uh, let's see. Oh yeah, open office. I love it because during these times now, it, it's funny because all these startups and businesses, especially startups, they started out with these open office plans, right? Where you just, it, it would seem like fun because everything's open. There's no more desks. You can sit wherever you want or, or you didn't. You have to sit in these tables right next to each other and everyone had headphones on. It was real quote unquote communal and everything. Uh, but now during COVID, uh, that not so much, right? We need our space and everything now. And what's funny is, or maybe not ironic, I don't know, is these studies were released and we discussed them previously on Nerdstalker, how there was, it was proven that the open office plan was actually hurting productivity and hurting people who needed to do things like deep work and any of that type of thing. You think programmers, think designers, think uh, in strategy people or whatever, right? Um, they, they need that space to sort of think. And then you see larger companies, some of which I may or may not have worked with in the past, recently moved to that type of open office plan and spend a lot of money rolling it out only to run into COVID now. Oops. And now there are design companies now thinking about that whole plan and what a b bizarre mistake it was. So some of the things they see need to be addressed, number one, in the near term immediately is at least a six foot separation in desks between people now. So good luck with cramming people in small spaces now because that doesn't really work anymore. So that's the easy plan, but not really, you know, that's debatable too because now there are studies being released that shedding is happening from 13 to 21 feet to even 25 feet because it's just in the air, right, so to speak. So another huge problem with, uh, especially in, in places like um, sky rises or skyscrapers and large buildings, I'm going to keep referring to San Francisco because that's where I've worked, um, recirculating air, right? So you can't open windows anymore in these buildings, right? So there's all this recirculated air and it's never really been a high priority for companies to invest a lot in things like extra filtering, which is now needed, right? So that's an issue now because we're breathing each other's stuff and, you know, that whole thing. And then also they're suggesting doing things like, which I've seen recently at some grocery stores is where they place arrows on the floor. So they're adopting a lot of these hospital-like techniques. So you can only go, let's say in your work, on your office in a certain direction, right? You can only walk in a certain direction, say, you know, a certain thing. So the theory being somehow that you're not walking into each other's, you know, stuff or whatever or near, near each other, you're keeping that sort of distance and you're, fl you're flowing instead of crisscrossing. And then another idea they have too, 
and that they're saying in their redesign is things like uh, paper placemats for desks that are thrown away after your day of work, right? So again, another thing that hospitals are employing this type of things. So that way you're not doing any sort of common surfaces on the desk with your elbows or whatever and that type of thing. And uh, so, yeah, so that sort of things. It's, it's interesting to, to start think about those kind of redesigns of the office post COVID and um, these type of concerns, also a big stigma would be even going to work sick anymore. That used to be a thing. People are like, ah, I got the sniffles, I'll go to work still. And that was a very common thing. I mean, people would come literally with the flu. I hear people coughing and sneezing and that were obviously sick. And they're just there anyways, kind of riding it out. I, those, those days have got to be over, right? Oh, you know, you know I, what I was thinking about when you were talking about this article um, was WeWork. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and and I was thinking about, you know, how easy it was to transform these open warehouse spaces into mm -hmm. places for us to work. Right. The open mm -hmm. the open space um, design that you had mentioned earlier. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just go like, wow, to think that that not only. Um, it, you know, bad management and investment. Uh, bad. <laughs> we were killed it. You know, COVID nineteen probably killed them as well. I mean, it, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and especially buildings. You know, where HVAC, you know, technology hasn't really been invested heavily in. You know, uh, with uh, companies and buildings, and yeah, and we have been recirculating our air in these buildings and uh, really sort of improvements in filtration or putting a large budget into hardcore filtration has not also been a priority for uh, operations, let's say, did, of a uh, Did they a mention company. any um, solutions in the article or what they- Yeah, they did. They so things do? like double filtering is another thing. Um, mm. th apparently there's just all this filtering technology. The thing is like a lot of the solutions have been available, um, but it, like I said, it's just not been a financial priority for companies. Um, think about it, like where their budget has had to go. They, so this is another reallocation of money and uh, that's going to have to go another line item. So that'll take away from something else potentially for these businesses. Right. Yeah. So it's an impact of uh, our uh, continually evolving uh, state of being. <laughs> you know, all so, right, Greg. All right, so dude. next story, what is this a uh, jazz musician? Oh, you know, I followed this blog. Uh, I, I'm a, I'm a music junkie, ex-musician, but not as good as Adolfo, my friend was. He was a very good singer from what I understand. Hey, it's not me, it's punk. the people that say that. But okay. punk. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Daniel Bennett um, is a guy I just saw, and I, I just saw this article and he said that, you know, it caught my eye, that virus will die, but our cultural renaissance. So, yeah, so basically, um, you know, I, I, I read his article and I was going like, Wow, what a great point, you know, because he, he's talking about creative people and how um, some people, if they think very negatively, essentially, um, will keep themselves from growing. It's it's kind of, a, um, I think it was talked about mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, uh, a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. You know, he, sure. he didn't really say that in this article, but that's what I uh, uh, attributed it to. Right, right. And so he came up with some tips where, you know, he kind of said that, like, um, you know, when creative people fix problems, he says here, when your sink is leaking, guess what? You call a plumber. The plumber is not simply optimistic about the job. They're confident because they know how to fix things, right? And so, so what he mm -hmm. goes on to say is that, you know. Uh, um, just, just to repeat, because your audio got kind of weird there. Oh, sorry. Um, what, sorry. what Greg said was uh, creative people fix problems. When, you, when your sink is leaking, you call a plumber. Got it. Yeah. And it's just not simply, you know, they're not optimistic. They're experts, right? right. And so uh, he's right. suggesting that, um, creatives like uh, you and I and or other people um, look at it maybe this whole uh, COVID quarantining thing a little bit differently so um, and it's mainly positive thinking I, I, I attribute it to because uh, I had a small Twitter conversation with him online and he really has this positive attitude I felt that that's that's what it was exuding in the words he was sending back on on our Twitter con uh, uh, chat a little bit that's good that's so cool. uh, so stop murmuring each day because uh, you know you notice in the media Good tip. Day one, day two, day three, and now we're freaking yeah. at day 30, right? And like, right. you know, we're all tired of it, really, quite frankly. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And um, he's saying that, you know, just, you know, it's a new day. You know, mm -hmm. just, just go on with your day, and it's just another day. It's just a different day, but sure, new day. Um, you're not on pause. Now, this one really struck me, because I put this on my Facebook page, is that I really felt that, like, people think their lives are on hold. Mm. 
but I kind of thought about it as a different way of maybe a trajectory in my life. This allows mm -hmm. me to do different things that I uh, need to go do, uh, like maybe yeah. clean the house more or pay sure. attention to you know, other people in my household a little bit more, that type of thing. So I yeah. think that was a very um, interesting thing he had mentioned. And then mm -hmm. he thinks we talk too much of vi about the virus. He mentioned that in a Twitter chat this morning mm -hmm. that he thinks the media is just too hyper focused on it mm -hmm. and it's causing some issues with certain people, you know, so mm -hmm. um, sure. I totally agree with that. Uh, stop complaining. Um, there's a lot of people who are complaining mm -hmm. about a lot of little different things. Uh, of course, we yeah. don't. We don't on this channel. We do not complain, right? No. <laughs> no, we, <laughs> we, don't. Question. we question. <laughs> um, stop depressing your fans. That's pretty funny. I think it's mm. like you know, it's it's so hard to you know because everyone is folk hyper focused online these days, and then yeah, you know, if you're this you know band band leader or you know guy who's really kind of popular, you know, you could affect a lot of people like mm -hmm. any other celebrity, yeah. right? So he's kind of thinking of that and. Um, you know, check in with people. I mean, this he uses music contents, but I think in the everyday life, you could just keep on checking in with people. You yeah, know? find yeah, out how your mom, brother, you haven't talked to right. in a while. Um, learn technology. So basically, he, in this part of it, he in the story, he talked about his mom and got her up to speed with using online. And, you know, it's been great ever since, you know. And so uh, donate to those in need. And um, so, so basically, it's kind of like what Dale Doherty was in the article is really helping out your fellow, fellow man in a time of need, right? So yeah, <laughs> any, uh, any comments on this one? You know, um, can you go back up uh, yeah, now that sure. you close that page? Sorry. Awesome. <laughs> 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 to, uh, I think it was number two. Where was it? Because I yeah. totally thought of some. No, stop depressing your fans up more. Yeah, you're not on pause. Stop numbering each day. Yeah, yeah, uh, you're not on pause. Yeah, so you're not on pause, number two. And I immediately, I was listening to, uh, I listened to Jujitsu jiu po uh, podcasts a lot. And one of, I really like is called uh, BJJ Mental Models. And uh, they talk about con more conceptual stuff. And one of them, one of them this day was, I, I can't remember, it was like an entrepreneurial day for Jujitsu or something like that. But uh, they brought up the, the fact that a lot of economists say that in times like this, uh, wealth is created. Um, so there's so much opportunity and it, it sounds a little bit, uh, I don't know, people can look at that in different ways, right? But it's true. There's a lot of opportunity at, at this, uh, you know, point. Uh, if you want to look at at bottom or near bottom, we're definitely, <laughs> we're definitely a, on a low end of the economic trajectory. And that's when, um, you know, a, as they say, that's sort of like when seeds are, are planted, right? And so there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, from that type of perspective. So that's something to think about. And, and it doesn't only have to be financially, it could be like mentally as well. Like if you want to learn something, I know me and Greg talk about all this crazy stuff that that's possible and things are doing now, whether it's like learning how to play piano in my case or, or shooting, you know, learn how to shoot archery or whatever. Like I, I'm just bringing a bunch of, bunch of stuff that I like to do here. But, um, okay. you know, what, whatever it may be for you, like learning a new language or whatever, um, or even potentially starting or thinking about starting a new business, um, if you have that kind of capital or whatever. I know that sounds like a big endeavor, but, uh, or investing in, if you do have a little bit of cash on hand, investing in a company that you probably couldn't afford it you know, when it was at its peak highs, that looked really good. Um, those things can benefit you and your, your children in the future. So any, you know, it's that whole looking and, and there's all these possibilities right now. Next one, speed round. Speed round. All right, so going from the positive stuff to the negative stuff, uh, <laughs> I have always had this sort of thing against college in a way. <laughs> and that's where me and Greg, I think has sort of, may or may not diverge in a way. I know Greg's very involved in, in college university type of stuff. And, and I never, I never did college university. I went to a little bit of it, but um, I got recruited out of school. And, um, and now looking back, I just, I, I don't see the benefit of it for some people. All right. Um, but I do for others to some extent, but to, to tie to that sort of mindset, that sort of mindset, uh, universities are really concerned right now that students and parents won't want their children to come back. And I think that may be the case in these conditions right now and for several different reasons, as well as some universities and colleges are 
they're going to drop the SAT and the SACT requirements altogether. And this isn't uh, just any lowbrow universities that are thinking of doing this. We're talking University, UC Berkeley, Indiana University, Auburn University, University of Virginia, and UNLV are just uh, cutting it all together. Some universities are mulling the idea of allowing their students to just take the, take the SAT at home, which sounds totally ridiculous to me. But um, that's another thing that people are thinking of doing. And the Times is reporting that uh, the pandemic has already cost universities millions of dollars uh, as they consider the possibility of remote classes into the fall. They're worried about losing students too. Parents and students are rethinking their choices in a world altered by the pandemic. And university is concerned about their potential for shrinking enrollment and lost revenue. So um, a lot of students have let's say applied to these far off universities or whatever, and they're thinking, you know what, maybe I'd be better going to the local university or state college instead. So those other big time universities or other places are losing it as well. Additionally, uh, lucrative spring sports seasons have been canceled, room and board payments have been refunded, and students at some schools are demanding hefty tuition discounts for what they see as a lost spring term. Other revenue sources like study abroad programs and campus bookstores have dried up and federal research funding is threatened. Already colleges have seen their endowments weakened, weakened and worry that fundraising efforts will founder even as uh, many families need more financial aid. They also expect to lose international students, especially from Asia because of travel restrictions and concerns about studying abroad. Foreign students usually pay full tuition, and then they represent a significant revenue source everywhere, from Ivy League to community colleges. And some institutions are projecting $100 million in losses for the spring, and many are now bracing for even bigger financial hit in the fall when some planning for the possibility of having their to continue remote classes. Uh, administrators anticipate the students grappling with the financial and psychological impacts of the virus could choose to stay closer to home, as I mentioned, go less expensive schools, take a year off, or not go to college at all. Ding, ding, ding. A higher education trade group has predicted a 15% drop in enrollment nationwide, amounting to a 23 billion, that's with a B, billion revenue dollar loss. The corona forced campuses to shut down at a time when higher education, which employs nearly 4 million people across the country, was already facing major challenges. Uh, population declines are expected to reduce enrollment, even as skyrocketing tuition and student debt has led to questions about whether a college education is worth the cost. Again, ding, ding. Um, <laughs> in mid-March, Moody's investors service downgraded the outlook for higher education from stable to negative predicting that institutions with strong endowments and cash flows like Harvard or Stanford would weather the virus, uh, while smaller ones would not. But even wealthy universities have begun announcing austerity measures. Jeez, Christmas. You know, that's interesting because um, I, I, I'm- There's a I'm lot on, there, man. Yeah, I'm on the, I'm on the board of Cal Poly and yeah. one of the engineering colleges, right? Yeah. And, um, one of the ways they were trying to raise money uh, being kind of like the central California campus, right? They're in the middle of kind of in between LA and us, right? And, hmm. and um, what they were trying to do is bring in a lot more foreign students. Well, guess what? Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. see that happening. So yeah. any soon. Good luck with that. Cool. Yeah. And, and going back to, I think we talked about it in a podcast, like probably 2012, 2013. I, I don't know exactly, but remember we talked about well, a lot of these other universities popping up. Uh, open universities, that type of thing. Yeah, right? yeah open HCI, there's yeah. a ton of them, yeah. yeah. Now, now I think it, it's going to be a mix, right? Because I don't think I don't think the system's going to allow a doctor to come out of those open universities. <laughs> of <laughs> course, know? right. We're right. talking about, the, well, you bring up a good point then. Um, who really needs uh, university training? Now, you know, medical training is, is a, kind of a separate thing. Um, legal training? I mean, could that be done online? Maybe, yeah. No, um, I, I agree with you. Does everyone need it? And so, you know, we've brought this up before that the university higher education system was ripe for disruption, ripe for disruption. Oh, yeah. And now is the time for a company like Amazon to come in and gut Ooh. them, I Ooh. think, you know, Ouch. Or, Ouch. or even Apple or, or someone, you know, uh, probably Ouch. Amazon though, I think. Uh, I know that they've, they're going after the, 
the pharmaceuticals right now too, to some extent, and obviously the grocers we were talking about were, were up for disruption as well. But man, higher education with this, it's, uh, it seems to man be manifesting. I think YouTube University should give out BSs. Yeah, real interesting. <laughs> yeah, All right, yeah. so the not so speed round. The not so speed round. <laughs> How cool. veggies? Well, yeah, hey. <laughs> I know we go from education to veggies. How's that? Yeah, veggies. You know? All right. Okay, keep it in life. Let's really go, baby. exciting. Uh, Welcome anyway. to the Today Show. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I got this from Oprah, by the way. No. Um, but anyway, um, it, what what kind of got, got me these, this week is that when I was having such a hard time, we talked about this the last few weeks, is getting groceries. Right. right. And now I'm thinking like, so I had these seeds from, I thought a pumpkin. I said, I don't know what I was going to do with them. I had them like stored yeah. away and, you know, you know, Smart. I think it was a pipe dream, quite frankly, you know, I yeah, mean, yeah, I, yeah. I, now that I have all this time on my hands, it's like, yeah. you know, I have some soil, I, you know, I have a pot, you know, and I just put that on the windowsill, put a couple of these seeds. Guess what? I got like six seeds this week because it got warmer this week. Right. Yeah. And it's like, so then I kind of went online and kind of like, oh, you could actually grow vegetables from kitchen scraps. So, so totally. you check the, yeah, you check this video out. Like if you cut out that like end of the onion that has like the, 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 the roots from it, you yeah. can actually put that back in water and regrow it. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, potatoes the same way. Um, they, they demonstrate yep. on this video. If you want to catch it, um, uh, celery. So, you know, check out yep. this video and we'll put it in the links, but I think it's like, it was awesome that Life Hacker kind of put this together. So thanks yeah. to Joel Kahn and uh, Therese McPherson for this. Speed round. Speed round. Uh, going back to that. Backwards. <laughs> to what Greg was talking about. It's insane that you bring that up because uh, me and the wife were just talking about that today. So I was talking about, dude, we need to, we need to, dude, I call my wife dude, by the way. No. And uh, we need to grow food. You know, we go to the grocery store, and I've been a couple times, and I'm sure as many people have seen the produce section is empty-ish, and it kind of makes you think, I need some stuff. I need some herbs. I need some produce. I should be growing it, especially if you have any kind of yard or don't. There's all these indoor systems as well where you can grow your own foods in your apartment and stuff like that, you know, your herbs uh, with a little indoor system, hydroponic, uh, up, you know, stand-up little system. Or in your backyard, you can do another stand-up little system or horse troughs or whatever and grow things. So, yeah, I think that's uh, very timely. And I went to YouTube and noticed that, you know, how to type in how to start your own garden type of thing uh, for how to grow your own fruits and vegetables, whatever. And uh, it was a video from 2015, but you could see the hits on it just whoosh, because I think everyone is searching that right now. Yeah. What's this thing about? Uh, uh, specialized. No, well, specialized. Yeah, so yeah. the bike company Specialized is offering free bikes just to uh, any of you essential workers out there. If you don't know, they will they will give you a free bike. So what you have to do is just go to their site, uh, Google it, and you can apply for a free bike on their online portal. And this goes to essential workers and those have been app impacted uh, by COVID or not and you are working, they're offering these transportation alternatives. Um, so check them out. I'm trying to look for the That's deadline cool. now. 100% of the proceeds go to your selected retailer. Let's see, click and collect. Oh, people can donate as well. Um, so awesome. check it out. Go to what is it called? Specialized. Specialized. <laughs> and they will, yeah. and um, they will set yeah. you up. So hurry up. There is a deadline uh, for this for you. Uh, oh, April 22nd. All right, you guys. So Specialized is accepting applications until April 22nd. Six more so days. Go check it out. Six more days. <laughs> Alarm clocks. Now let's let's face it. I don't know what day it is anymore. <laughs> let alone let alone. I do want to stay in my little comfy bed because my commute has gone from uh, a few miles to ten feet now. Right. So uh, so you know I want to stay. You know especially on some cold days that have you know and not as cold as back east, but for san francisco you know we got some cold days right and we've yeah, been before man. you know so so i thought this was so cool to have the the, the uh thanks to you to honkyat uh who's kind of like it's a, it's a design uh site oh, cool. um they have a bunch of really cool alarm clocks it's very, in fact one kind of rolls around in the room so you have to get out of bed to go turn it off <laughs> Uh, yeah, I thought yeah, that was yeah. so cool. Yeah, that was chase, so cool. Right. Yeah, basically, you have to chase it. It won't shut yeah. up until until you chase it, chase its ass out the door. You know, so so it's kind of funny. But uh, but check that out. I, I thought they have some really unique t uh, alarm clocks. It not only shows creativity and design, but also creativity in waking your butt up out of bed. Nice. 
What's this next one? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next story. Next story is uh, planned obsolescence. The outrage of our electronic waste mountain. So ironically, uh, Greg, you were talking about the maker movement, and I brought up one of the things is this whole problem, especially now with the you know supply lines being impacted and people unable to get things from China. This has brought on a near-term huge issue with people trying to support or up ma maintain their phones, their laptops, purchase parts for their laptops. Uh, maintain and purchase parts for ventilators as well. Um, with this current way of planned obsolescence that we're building these devices by big companies like Apple and Amazon are the no notorious ones, um, we're having a huge problem right now. Instead of having to, having to buy a whole new device in this economic super tightening that's happening for individuals. The problem with a lot of these phones is a lot of parts that we used to be able to swap out on phones are now glued to motherboards, things like batteries or oh. CPU or whatever that are, or batteries, I should say, right? So you can't replace your battery. You have to replace the entire device. Think of an iPhone, think of an Amazon type of device. That's a huge, huge problem. And, um, you know, Apple's touting the recyclability, but really when it comes down to it, only 20% of it can be recycled of, a, I believe, an iPhone really? um, because these lithium-ion batteries. And then again, China's supply of parts are an issue now with those in limited supplies and people having to wait a long time. You, you know, you have to buy a $1,000 phone for what should be, let's say, a $200 repair or something like that. It just, it really doesn't make sense. And what they're finding is now everyone's scrambling to learn how to maintain and repair ventilators um, because you just can't order a part for a ventilator or something like that. And it's a, it's a very, very big deal. So this whole sort of uh, method of planned obsolescence when creating devices needs to be re rethunk. And I know back in the 90s, going back to the 99% conference a long time ago, all these designers and UX designers and, and big time thinkers back then were, were talking about this notion of cradle to cradle design right? So there's not a whole lot of waste. Now it's different in that it wasn't, it wasn't so much focusing on the interchangeability of the parts or being able to fix it, but so much as it just doesn't fill the landfill. But there's a kindred spirit there, right, type of thing, where a lot of the stuff is going to landfill. But we also need to be able to fix our devices, especially in economic really tight times like this. We, you know, look at, look at Cuba using old cars, right? that type of thing. I mean, they, they can replace little parts or fix little things as a necessity. We need to be able to fix our phones. Phones are critical right now for people uh, in everyday life and computers. Think about your kids' education, people with Chromebooks and things like that. You need to be able to upgrade and fix and swap out parts of your laptops and, and machines and things, right? So that's a huge deal. Now, I know the company I fix it was advocating or part of an advocacy group or some of their company was for a movement that was really gaining some momentum called Right to Repair. Right to Repair was the advocacy movement. They were gaining a lot of uh, you know, headway and then the coronavirus struck and sort of has stopped that. But now it's kind of become an issue again. And we're hoping that, and they're hoping that they're positioned in the right place right now to get some momentum, hopefully, uh, when they can get some, some emphasis on this for people's right to repair their devices. And hopefully companies will you know, take wow. this a little more seriously. Now I know they want to, you know, companies want to maximize their bottom line. So they want to sell you a thousand dollar phone every year or every two years, you know, max, but we need to, uh, we need to rethink this. All right, man. Tip time. Mm. Tip tip time, time. Tip let's go with, let's go, let's go with your tip first. Greg. Oh yeah. 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 Um, I, I didn't know this, you know, so like when you go to your iPhone, um, so you can see that there, there's yeah. these little, um, there's this article from, uh, thank you to Apple insider for this. Um, where if you tap the AA in the near the um, the web address window, you right. can actually request a mobile website or go back to a desktop website. So you could toggle Such the views. Right. Yeah, it is because let's right. let's face it, not all websites are really optimized for mobile right. very well, or or vice versa. You know they're right. it, you know that's they're, so awesome, they're, and it they're, removes they're, the ads and everything, right? Exactly. Exactly. So cool. Exactly. And I thought that was a great tip to have for you guys to kind of look at yeah. and in it. I like that. The Atlas part is really cool. <laughs> yeah. And just for some of you guys, so you know, I think that's a Safari only thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's Safari yeah, only. Yeah. So yeah, if you're Safari using only. Chrome on your iPhone, not a bit, not a good thing. Or if yeah, you're using go back. Gmail yeah, on your that's phone right. like me. Remember Google so makes great. money on their ads. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And sort of jumping on the Google. Now my tip going back to Google, uh, YouTube, 
a lot of people don't know this, but under the little gear icon, when you're watching a video on YouTube, and you can click that and there's the speed option. And oh. I do not watch a video under 1.25 speed now. So I can take in a lot more information. It's really weird for me now because I can't wow. take the normal pace. I mean, even when I listen to this podcast that we're doing right now, I listen to it at one and a half speed, right? <laughs> Cause I can no longer listen to a normal pace podcast. Uh, so you can do that with a lot of a lot of different things now, and you can do it with YouTube as well, which is awesome. Um, a lot of things I watch are minimum 30 minute videos, and uh, I just don't have the time for that. So sometimes I'll watch a double speed or at least 1.75 x speed, and you can just intake a lot more data that way and learn a lot of stuff quickly Whoa. and use your time a little smarter. So uh, it's uh, something you definitely want to consider, all of you out there. Watch right. your videos faster on YouTube. I and bow to you. Again. That was the best <laughs> tip of this podcast. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. Well, another one's in the can. Thank you so much for watching and listening yeah. out there. Uh, Greg, any final words? No, I, we would appreciate, uh, you know, kind of listening to our podcast and seeing all the different channels out there. So we thank you. And also, uh, you know, help us out by uh, visiting, at least visiting and looking at our Patreon page. We really appreciate it, um, you know, so we could bring awesome content like this to you every week.